YouTube radio. I'm sitting here. It is so sunny in the UK. At last, the sun has arrived to the UK, and we can all stop being Casper the Friendly Ghost, and we can come out and be tanned, beautiful people, rich in vitamin D. <laughs> Hi, Betty. <laughs> Hi. Uh, it, you know the sun. The sun does something cool to the UK. It all. It all makes us far more interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. Everyone gets really excited, and you know we have barbecues and we do loads of cool stuff and we socialise more. I don't know. The sun. The sun was just good, but I still love the other seasons. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of all the English seasons. Me too, and here in Sydney at the moment, it's um, it's cold actually. I'm I'm stood here in my office with a, a hoodie and a, a jacket on underneath. But um, I love Sydney winters because they're cold, but they're really crisp and sunny. It's I was out for a walk this morning, seven o'clock this morning, and the sun was rising. It was bloody cold, but it's just so beautiful. But I'm the same. I really like seasons. I don't think I'd like to live somewhere where it, it wasn't. You know, it didn't have cold winters and warm summers and, you know, spring and autumn. I like I like to have the seasons too. The problem with the sun is, I know we're all like, oh, it's amazing. But if I lived in somewhere, let's say I lived in Spain, where it's nice and hot, pretty much eight, nine months of the year, I wouldn't, well, I think I'd probably adapt, but I don't think I'd get a lot of work done. Because I think we're in the mindset that as soon as it's sunny in the UK, you're like, well, screw work, it's not going to be sunny for that long, so I'm going to get outside and enjoy it. Um, like in the UK, I'll get up early and work, and then I'll be like, right, from two or three onwards, I'll then go in the sun, and I've already done my day's work kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know what I'd be like in a sunny climate. Here's the thing. I thought exactly the same thing. So this is my 10th year in Australia, and when I first moved here, obviously I had that problem coming from the UK, particularly Wales, where it rains a lot in Cardiff. Um... I came over and every time it was sunny, I obviously didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to go to university at the time when I was doing my, my postgrad studies. And I would almost feel like I was being deprived if I had to work when it was sunny outside. And I, that is purely a UK mentality. When you come from uh, the UK or actually anywhere where the sun doesn't come out very often and it's not a regular feature, you become obsessed with it. And it's funny, like, I think I was, after about the first, it took me about two years to really, really settle into working when it was sunny outside. And now I can honestly say I, I can't remember the last time I went to the beach, um, you know, other than just randomly on the, on the weekend if I've got a couple of hours, you know, to kill. Um, it's just not one of those things that, and I particularly I don't like going out in the sun very much just because I'm, you know, I don't want to age. So it's not something that, you know, I love the feeling of sun on my skin, but it's funny how your preferences change when you do live in a hot climate where the sun does shine a lot. Mm. Mm. I know that seems impossible for you now, but I'm glad that it's sunny over there and I'm glad that you're liking it. And I, I'm sorry that I've dragged you in inside to record a podcast. Well, I'll be honest, it's not a massive biggie. It is 7am in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, we do have fun on these podcasts because we are absolutely hilarious. Um, yeah, we should probably stop talking about the weather though because it's probably it's it's like that it's that conversation <laughs> that you start when you don't know what else to start. Like you go to see your hairdressers, and you're like, oh, it's a lovely day outside. <laughs> like, yeah, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> oh, what did you do on the weekend? I fucking hate that small talk that goes on at hairdressers. Seriously. <laughs> 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 particularly when you're in a hairdresser for like four hours like trust me try having long blonde hair it's a killer yeah I haven't been in the hairdressers for longer than 15 minutes so <sighs> okay well trust me you get through a lot of small talk in four hours yeah but anyway <laughs> we digress <laughs> a lot <laughs> what's been happening in your world Benny I saw you now a week ago we did we Just met each other ago. in Marbella and no, yeah. in the UK, which yeah. is lovely and good fun. We had our seminar, which apparently went down really well, and everyone seems to have fun, so that was cool. I'm heading to Marbella again next week. <gasps> Tough then life. Yeah, then I'm having my birthday in Barcelona. Uh, so there's a lot going on, and then we're 
I uh, I've just been I haven't been on social media and stuff as much at the moment purely because uh, I'm working really hard on the new body time nutrition website and we're improving our academy programs, making it better, better education, better standards, better interaction and stuff. Um, of which I might as well mention it. First of August, our foundation academy launches. So if you're young in the game of nutrition, you want to get to grips with physiology, the basics of macronutrients and calories, how to coach people. Foundation is an incredible two-month intensive course before our main academy starts on the 1st of October. Uh, if you did want to find out more information about that, go and visit www.bodytypenutrition.co.uk and click the Academy tab. Awesome, that sounds very exciting. And then anything else that's happening in my world is top secret. <gasps> I have such an um, exciting announcement to make that. I'm not sure if I can do it yet. I think I have to wait till Thursday. So it's only Tuesday today, and I have to wait until Thursday. So well, no one will hear this until Thursday anyway. So. <sighs> yeah, I know, but just in case it's not out when you release this, I can't say it yet. So it'll have to be the week after. <laughs> in that case, <laughs> let's roll all on with I the show. Say, all I can say is this. All I can say is this: Do not ever give up on your goals. If you have got something in your mind that you cannot go a day without thinking about, make it happen. Because something has just happened to me, which has been a goal of mine for the past 10 years. When I was 21, I set this goal and I set the intention. And every day since I've worked towards it and it has just come to fruition. That's all I shall say for now. But, um, do not give up on your goals. You just have to keep pushing. And it's there's been plenty of ups and downs over the past 10 years. And I can tell you now, like, just just keep pushing. That's all I'm going to say. Mm. It's, a, it's quite a, an interesting topic of mine at the moment, goal setting and kind of what you want to achieve and releasing people from, I don't know, they're kind of, yeah, their mental anguish. I'm, uh, I'm teaming up with someone in the UK at the moment to do a load of seminars uh, about mindset and how to get around all the, the roadblocks that people have. So how to unlock why you can't do things and then the building box to actually do things, which is what I'm going to talk about a bit more. And then the other person, I don't want to mention his name because it's not, you know, it's not written in stone yet, something we're having a lot of talks about. He's going to be doing a lot more about the mindset, why people can't make decisions, why they can't reach their goals, why they're not even clear on their goals, all that kind of stuff, because I think this and the psychology of why we do things is the next evolution in fitness, and it's what people need to hear, because at the moment, I believe that people are completely paralysed to a degree with the social media evolution, and that's created a lot of disjointed goals and a lot of disjointed mindsets with an awful lot of people. 100% agree, and I mean, obviously, this is something that we talked about when I was in London, and I, I really think now the next six sorry, 12 to 20, 12 to 18 months in fitness is going to be a lot more around the psychology of dieting and the psychology of nutrition and the psychology of why people don't achieve their goals. And like, you know, for those of you guys listening, um, Ben actually recorded a, a short video. It's like a two, three minute video this, this past week, actually. I'll find it. We should probably post a link in here somewhere. But it was an awesome video on goal setting. And the difference between people setting external and internal goals and, you know, those goals changing because the people that they're associating with are changing. So it's um it was a it's an excellent video. It's a short, sharp and it's an easy to easy to listen to one if you want to get a, a <laughs> yeah, tip your hat. Um, you know, if you want to get a general overview on the type of stuff that Ben talked about at our seminar, um in London a couple of weeks ago, so it's um, that's an awesome video. John, so thanks, Benny. Talking of our seminar, I was actually really pissed off. I didn't record some of our stuff because the beginning talk. I don't. <laughs> I don't want to blow my own trumpet here, but like the first talk that I did, I was really happy with how it kind of went because I was saying to you that a lot of people turned up to our seminar and we wanted to talk a lot about kind of nutrition, female health, and I just. I took the seminar in the way that I wanted to and I just went a lot more down a goal setting route and I think I asked some really good questions of the people that were there and really tapped into 
why, 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 why are we doing all this stuff? Why are you making these actions? Why aren't you making the best decisions for your health? And um, I don't know, I think I need to go and record some kind of seminar like that because I'm just really pleased with how the content came out because I, I just genuinely feel it's what people need to hear. I think it's a very much a missing element. And I think one of the things, particularly in online training, obviously I, I've specialized in online training, particularly over the past 18 months, is I see a lot of program hoppers. Uh, people going from you know one person, one program to another program, and obviously that's very easy to do when you're online. And I think a reason for that is that there's so much information out there nowadays. It's paralysis by analysis, or analysis paralysis, whatever it is. I just, irrelevant. Um, so you know, and and being able to set those goals for yourself and not anybody else. And again, like. I think, like, you're right, that opening talk that you did was awesome and, you know, also addressing the reason why people compete because most of the time it's not for themselves mm. and if it is, then it's to mask an eating disorder, quite frankly. So, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I've got a training partner at the moment who I'm training with in my uh, off-season bulk, <laughs> which is going very well. <laughs> I almost have a bit of a, I have a good winter layer. Um, I, I was speaking to him about, you know, what, what he's doing. He was now going to go into a, a bit of a contest prep phase. He was going to compete in like nine weeks time. And, you know, I, I just said to him, I was like, what, why are you doing it? Because, you know, when, when people tell you they want to compete or they've got a goal and you can see it in their eyes, it's not their goal. It's not deep down. They're not 100 percent committed and fired up by it. It's happened by a mixture of internal and external influences and maybe pressure and expectation on themselves. And I'm like, why are you doing it? And then we, we spoke a bit later on. And he was like, you're right, I'm not ready. Let's get back in the gym. Let's carry on bulking. Let's keep training. And I just, I always want to ask that question of people with their goals. And people now need to ask that question of themselves. Why, why, why? Is it real? Have you done it for your own reasons? Is it an external reason? Did you see it on Instagram and thought it would be a great idea? Um, and I just think it's such a basic concept, but it's obviously you know, because it's right in front of people and people don't want to confront themselves on it, they're a bit too scared to ask themselves that question. Mm. It does piss me off sometimes. You know, like it seems like a, such a one-track road, and like this is nothing. Like, it's not about like banging out a bikini and bikini competitors or, or figure competitors or bodybuilders or anything it's just as a general observation that to become uh, it, it appears to be that women think that to be to get into fantastic shape they have to compete and that is not the case at all you do like you do not have to compete to get into fantastic shape you can get into great shape like amazing shape like photo shoot shape and not compete. And you know, if you if to compete, I think there was an article actually on T Nation that was posted recently, and I can't remember who wrote it. But if you're considering getting on stage, you should only consider getting on stage if you've already got the best physique in your gym. Until you've worked for many many years to get to the point where you have the most fantastic physique in your gym, what is the point in competing? Mm. So just keep going with that a long term goal. You know, I get a lot of people ask me, well, well you know. I want a physique like yours, Rachel. I'm like, well, I've been lifting since I was 13 years old, and I'm now 31. That's a lot of years in a gym, yeah, and a lot of it. years. I know I'm really old, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a lot of years in a gym. It's a lot of hard graft. That's a that's a lot of calories. That's a lot of DOMS, and it's a lot of work gone in to get to where I am today. So please don't think that it happens overnight or over a six month prep. It does not. It is years and years and years and years and years of hard work. So I just uh, sort of throw that out there. And I am going to expand because I had a realisation in the gym as well when I was talking to my training partner in that my off-season training right now is the most successful block of training I've ever had. And it pisses me off. <laughs> Not that much, but it pisses me off to a degree because I look at what I've done for the last 10 years and it's not to say that I haven't worked hard. I have. You know, I've done what I thought was the right way, the right method, the right work ethic. And, it, it, you know, I'm training very much like a bodybuilder this summer. So my key remit this summer, there's no other goal. All it is is to put on muscle mass. That's it. 
okay? So I'm eating a lot, I'm now up to 4,100 calories. Um, I started at 3,300. So I've gone up a good amount. And I'm training hard and it's really high volume. And it was interesting because I got a comment when I was talking about a training variable on my Facebook page and they were like, oh, your training program looks like it's really high volume. And I'm like, well, yeah, it is. He goes, oh, I could never do that much. I was like, how long have you been training? He's like, oh, two years. I'm like, well, A, that's part of the you know the thing already. If you are only now been in the gym for a year or two, you can do single sets of squats, single sets of bench, a very basic training program of three or four exercises per body part, for example, and get great results because the body is adapting to that early stress. Now, I've been doing quite a lot over the years, and I'm now realizing that to get where I want to be, definitely in terms of muscle mass, I've got to work really hard. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to do a training and a video update on Facebook uh, this coming week. But you know, to give you an example of our upper body session yesterday, we did um, shoulder press, but we did a strict set for eight, and then we did a drop set, and then I did a partial range at the bottom, and I did a partial range at the top. So I did four sets of eight within a set of eight. And I did four sets of that, and then we did the similar for laterals. Then I did pre-exhaustion sets with my training partner. Then I did resistor, I resisted isotension. Literally walking out the gym going, yep, yeah, that muscle group completely, completely fucked. It's gone. And I realized that at the point I'm at now, I'm only really training hard. And that annoys me because I'm, I'm 10 years in, and I'm making the best progress I've ever made. And I shouldn't be. Almost. I shouldn't be because... And it kind of annoys me with how I pay. I paid so much attention to my learning process, actually gathering the knowledge, but I don't think I truly engaged in it, and that annoys me. So when I thought about a bicep curl, I was thinking about it, but I wasn't really thinking about it. I wasn't thinking about the way that my wrist moved, the way that the muscle contracted at the bottom, at the top, the length of movement I'm going through, where I'm strongest, where I'm weakest, and actually going, if I can work all of those variables really hard, and then a bit more, and then eat properly and eat enough, my progress would have been profound. And I kind of said to my training partner, I was like, I was like, Jamie, all the stuff I'm doing right now, do you think I'm giving people enough knowledge to make progress and not mistake, make all the mistakes I'm making? And at the moment, I don't think I am. And I've got. To, I'm going to go away and say to myself, how do I, how do I enable more people to shortcut my mistakes? Because everyone wants a fantastic body. Everyone wants a great physique. I get that, and I respect that. I do as well. But there's obviously other important parts that need to play a role: um, health, lifestyle, fitness, general conditioning, well-being, etc. But how do we get people there in the safest way, but really instilling the right kind of work ethic? I think it's. Just, I think a lot of it is learned through experience, as with anything. And you know, we can fast track it to some degree, and that's what happens when you have a coach. But I think only when you actually experience these things. And this is why I love to run practical training sessions with people, you know, and and practical seminars because. I can give somebody, I'll give you an example. So um, the first phase of my membership site, the Athletic Fox Blueprint, it's um, it's a pretty strict, pretty straightforward program. So there's two wait days. So you train uh, program A on Monday and Thursday and program B on when, uh, sorry, Tuesday and Friday. And then you've got two interval training days in there as well. So it's a six day a week training program. So one of the things that I, um, I frequently note is that more slightly more advanced lifters say, oh, but this program's too easy. I'm like, well, hang on a minute. Have you actually tried it? Have you really tried this program where it's an, it's an, an upper body split, um, sorry, upper lower body split, so you do A1 and A2? Have you actually tried the program where you've gone to the gym, you've hit the reps, sets, tempo, rest periods at the appropriate weight? Because I can tell you now, if you have, and you've done it as if I was there coaching you, you would not find this easy. So I think the way sometimes, you know, programs are written now is particularly like, they're really complex programs, and they don't need to be. It's the, in, it's the intention behind it. It's actually the work that goes on behind the training. I don't think that that can be taught in a 
in a you know in a short term manner. I think it's a learned activity over you know a period of years, and I think you do shortcut that when you when you have a coach. But you know, how do we shortcut it from there? I don't know, and I do think it is partly a learning experience. I yeah I I I, I, I kind of get that, but I wanna. I feel kind of, I don't know, now part of me feels socially responsible that I need to create some kind of system of teaching, some pathway to ensure that people get this information in the right way. I think it's more younger people. Like I see, I go into any commercial gym and I look around and I'm like, I'd love to have the time to go and help all these different people, like a PT on the floor, but I don't. But I see so many people making all the same rubbish mistakes that I did and how do I change that? And I really want to change that because I believe that mastering your body, mastering your health is one of the most powerful things you can ever do in your life. You know, you know, it changes everything once you're in, in control of your health and your body 100%. And I think that's profound. Um, you know, link, link in a different aspect into this. When you did your seminar in London on that Friday, you were talking a lot about, um, I filmed you doing a clip where you were talking about the hamstring curl. And you were talking about the position of the hip, the position of the glute, how to make sure you go to full range, how to dorsiflex, plantar flex, rotate the ankle for different activations. And, you know, you talk about engagement in your program in the Athletic Fox Brewpin. And this is half the battle in that how do you, you almost, and again, okay, this is probably coming down to mindset. How do we fully engage someone in what they're doing right there and then? So rather than lying down on a hamstring curl and going, I'm doing a hamstring curl, and I'm going to work fairly hard by pulling my leg towards my bum and it going out again. But how do you get people to go, right, the next minute, I'm 100% focused on what's happening in this hamstring curl. I'm going to pay attention to the way that my hip moves, the way that I contract things, the way that it feels upon lengthening, the amount of force that I'm putting into it. And if you actually concentrate on all these things by being engaged in the moment, then I think we can achieve so much more. Now I'm gonna, I'm fucking going off on all sorts of shit here. I'm just apologise. Um, I was with the Lee Machines this weekend. We did some filming, and we talked about. I talked about the therapy that I've been going through. Have we talked about my therapy? That is in reviewing it and why. We we you talked about it a couple of months ago, but we haven't actually reviewed it. Oh, perhaps we should do that. But anyway, I was talking to the Lee Machines, and. I was talking about my therapy and uh, John had been talking about some stuff that he was kind of um, like thinking about himself on a kind of a personal development level and I know he won't mind me talking um, about this. I'm not going to say anything specific. Anyway, he was, we, we were talking about how so many of us think we live in the present, but we don't. We're there. But we're, we're never fully engaged. And this is probably partly the disease of the mobile phone in that we've got this thing in our pocket that's always crying for our attention and we're always thinking, oh, I wonder what's happening on the other side of the world. You know, um, is, uh, who, who was I talking to the other day? There was someone else that was talking to us. You know, when you, when you have your mobile phone on, this is one reason I don't have Wi-Fi or 3G on my phone when I'm not engaged in business type stuff. Because if I have that, if I even go to engage with my phone, the person I'm with has lost my attention straight away. The brain can't multitask. We think it can. Someone goes to look at their phone and you then look up and go, oh, pardon, I didn't hear it. No, you chose not to hear it by looking at your mobile phone and disengaging from the process. So none of us are really ever in the present. And this is probably part of the problem with the progress that we get and the lack of progress that I got is that I was so driven to make progress with my training and my nutrition that I was always looking at the next day rather than being genuinely, genuinely in that present day about the training, about the rep, about the food, about the calorie, about the hydration. And I think that's part of the answer, that people have to fully engage in everything and understand it. And this is obviously why education is so key, because without full engagement, you're never present and to miss out on all these different things and these processes is kind of sacrilege because this is the point where you, you go back and you're like, well, I can't actually remember my journey. I think it was good. You never engaged in it. You always look forward. And that, I don't know, it's a problem. And I think it's a bit of a travesty. It's about mindfulness, isn't it? And, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of uh, 
uh, mindset and performance coaches do is mindfulness. And you're absolutely right. And I try, you know, it's something that I've been very mindful of recently is particularly the past six months is when I'm walking down the street not to have my phone out because it was actually after, um, it was a video we both found actually, we both posted and it, do you remember that video? It was, it must have been about six months ago that we posted and it was about how many things that you might miss if you were walking down the street looking at your phone. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. That was a great, that was a great little clip and after that, I, I, unless somebody, obviously somebody called me, um, I try very hard not to have my phone out when I'm walking or when I'm engaging with somebody. And it's, it is hard, and you're absolutely right. I think the first step, the first practical step is don't have your phone in the gym, period. Get yourself a G-Shock watch or whatever. You know, I use my G-Shock to time rest periods, but I, I don't have my phone in the gym. Simple as that. It's just too much of a distraction. I have my phone in the gym sometimes, and then sometimes I don't. But I make the commitment that I'm fully engaging from one thing to the next. Yeah. So I don't, because a lot of people will get their phone out between the set and kind of play around and then half be like looking at it, going into their set, putting their phone away. There's never really a full disengagement and engagement. So again, it's like a mental switch. If I'm in the gym with my phone, and sometimes I have to do this because my day is moving at that kind of a pace that, for example, I, I'll do my social media stuff while I'm in the gym on my phone, like Twitter and stuff. And again, I, I, I've already made that decision. I'm like, well, I'm fully engaged in this set. I know I've got exactly two minutes to rest. I set my stopwatch and I've got two minutes to engage with my phone. Then I put it away, put it in my pocket, on the floor, wherever, and then I re-engage in my set. So I think... You can, a, you're an experienced lifter. Yeah, that that's that's what it comes down to. If you've been lifting for more than ten years, you know how to engage. You know how to put your mind in a muscle. You don't. It's second nature, and you don't really have to think about it. It's just one of those things that happens as soon as your hand touches iron. It's just on. It just happens. It's a naturally occurring thing. But I would counter argument that with what I've kind of previously been saying in that I've been mm. engaging but not fully engaging. I haven't fully been present. I've been there like 80, 90%, but now I'm there 100%. And it's only through a process, um, I think I mentioned this on the video that I recorded, that um, like training with Stephen Box, that really helped because he was talking a lot about engaging in the training process, muscular activation. Um, I mean, Stephen's a great coach who's part of our body type nutrition team. Um, my training partner as well, it made me fully realize that you know the stuff that I'm doing from a mental and a muscle point of view, fully, fully, fully engaged. So I kind of, I get your argument, but I would still say, despite my 10 years of experience, it's only really been recent revelations that I'm now fully engaging. I'm committed. And I do, I do agree with you. And I think, you know, you do have to have other training partners to see that. And I think some of the best people that I've trained with have been pro bodybuilders because they are the best people at really focusing and putting a mind in the muscle, you know, and that's just, a, you know, all right, this is a generic fly on the wall term, but you know, maybe it's just my experience of it. And, you know, 10 years ago when I arrived in Australia, I had a, um, you know, a, tr a training partner who was, who is now an IFBB pro. Um, and he was amazing. I learned a lot of things from him. So, Interesting little digression we've had there. Are we going to continue this? Well, yeah. <laughs> I I kind of want to talk about the therapy thing because I kind of I promised Let's everyone I, I promised you, everyone I would and I haven't yet. Um, yeah, you have, and you brought it up. So let's talk about it. Yeah, and so people know that I engaged in um, a load of psychotherapy. Had a therapist for a while, probably about four months. I was sort of actively engaging in it. And I did this because I personally wanted to know more about myself. I wanted to make sure that there was no demons in my closet, uh, which there was. And I wanted to know that these weren't going to affect my professional and personal relationships as I grow as an individual, because that's really important. As we've mentioned in this podcast for the last half an hour, is that the mind is the most powerful tool we have. And at the moment, everyone, and I would probably literally say everyone listening to this podcast, is underutilizing their physical potential, 
both from a realisation point of view and a past point of view, in that we haven't dealt properly with what's happened in the past. So the big thing in my lifestyle was my relationship with my dad uh, growing up, in that, uh, you know, it was a disjointed one. When we were younger, he was always away from home, he was never there, he worked in the military, so sometimes he'd go away for, to sea for like three to six months, wouldn't be around. Then my parents got divorced when I was 12, uh, that was obviously, it wasn't that messy, but it was, you know, it, it never ends well, a divorce and a family set up. And we obviously lived with our mum where things were quite uh, difficult for a while, quite tight, especially financially. Um, you know, single mum is never going to have it easy, trying to care for two boys and trying to do the right thing as well. And kind of that kind of distance and never having a father figure present and this is probably a key term today, like someone actively being there from a relationship point of view, obviously changed my personality quite a bit by um, not having part of that person in my life. So I've always felt that, you know, part of me always wanted to be recognised by my dad. You know, you wanted your dad to be there and just go pat you on the back and say, well done, son, you know, you've, you've done well. And I never, ever got that as a kid. And I've only really just got it in a roundabout way from my dad because I've bought my first house I've kind of set myself up and I'm in a really good place and you know um, dad sort of said oh you know well done well done in the house you know have a good life that kind of thing where I, where I saw him not so long ago and <clears throat> that was his roundabout way of doing doing that my expectation but I had to go through a process and realize that the person that I expected my dad to be wasn't ever going to be my dad like that just wasn't who he was so I had to find a way that mentally I had to learn how to accept that that relationship would be different not that uh, it was an unloving relationship but that it was just different and I had to learn how to accept that and I had to learn that um, all these expectations that I placed on him were my expectations and they were never going to be fulfilled because it was a manifestation of what I wanted to happen so my kind of therapist just enabled me to talk through all this stuff and not that there was ever really a powerful realisation but it, it we uncovered everything enough to know exactly how my character behaves and how to preempt the actions that my character will take and how to kind of not protect myself but manage it. So none of us are ever going to be what we would consider the perfect, well-balanced human being. We've all got our traits, our flaws, our pros, our kind, you know, whatever. All you've got to know, and what I think is truly powerful, is to know exactly how your body, your mind does things. And as soon as you learn all this stuff about yourself, then you you can you can unlock your potential and you can get through the past because there's so many people that want to be in the present. And want to look to the future, but they can't because they're bogged down in the past. And I mentioned this when we were on our seminar with Rachel on that Friday in London. I said one of the most powerful investments you'll ever make is going to speak to a therapist. Because even if you're, even if you think you're okay and you think you've dealt with anything that's in your past, I bet there's something there. There's something that lingers. We've all had something that plagues us. You might have had an argument with a friend at play school. 15 years ago and that comment or something has manifested itself and stayed with you you might have had a bad relationship bad boyfriend bad girlfriend parenting whatever there's probably something there that you need to deal with and i think for the sake of 100 200 300 400 pounds whatever that course of therapy takes you i think it would be one of the most powerful investments you'll ever make just on a note of that um, nursery school. I once had a child in nursery school called Virginia and she was bigger than me and she stole my doll and I somehow got over it. Do you think I have issues? <laughs> now, Miss Guy, I believe you're mocking me. I'm not mocking you. I'm just saying I, I remember her now. She had this she had this black dress on with like um, pink roses <laughs> alright granted this was a good like 28 years ago but I remember she stole my doll off me like I just remember her coming up and she took it off me the small blonde child of the nursery she stole it from me I'm not mocking you but like I can relate <laughs> I can just 
I remember that situation. Maybe I do have issues around that. I thought I let it go, but clearly I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I don't expect anyone to have any kind of profanity as a result of that, but I just wanted to share with people why why I did it, my rationale, because I know I've talked about it, and I just think if people are unsure about themselves, then it's, I think it's a process you should invest in, like, say to your personal trainer, now, let's say you've got a personal trainer or some kind of coach and you can only afford 40, 60, 80 pounds a month for that kind of stuff, and say to him, by the way, I'm not going to train with you for the next month or two. I'm going to go and speak to someone and make sure that everything with my mindset is good. Um, and probably my bit of final advice, it actually took me quite a long time to find a therapist to work with. I didn't, You with, with these kind of people, you can't just pick up the phone and go and work with anyone. You've got to resonate with them. You've got to feel 100% comfortable. And I just did this simply by the telephone and it, you can tell if you warm to someone over the phone. Like you'll pick it up and just the way that they answer, the way they ask you questions, the way they kind of short interview you, you'll kind of know. And I went through quite a few people. Um, I definitely didn't resonate with men. I think men have, you know, not as caring uh, character traits as women. So I think women would quite often be a better therapist than a man. That's not to say men can't be good therapists at all. Um, it's just, correlation uh it's the same with personal trainers you know women are a lot more caring pts than men are men have to work at that kind of stuff just like i have to work at being more caring because naturally as a man i'm not as wired up to be that way naturally so just take some time talk to these people over the phone and then when someone's like when you just feel like yeah they asked the right questions of me that kind of clicked then they'll be the right kind of person to work with um and, and yeah, I think it would be an amazing investment for people. And you have to look at it this way, right? Every high-performing individual, or let's talk, let's take athletes, for example, right? Every athlete, they're high-performance individuals. They have a whole team behind them. They have a physio, they have a doctor, they might have a chiropractor. They usually have a mindset and performance coach. So if you want to be a high-performing individual, whether it be in your business or your life, you've got a physio, you've got a doctor, so why aren't you using a high performance mindset coach just you know it's, it's something that people really miss out on and you know it's, it's definitely something that over the next six months that I'm going to I've got a lot of changes coming up um, over the next six months a lot of challenging ones so you know it's definitely something that I haven't done probably for about 18 months is I guess any personal development you know I read books and stuff but it's not the same um, I haven't really invested a lot of time in my personal development for the past 18 months and it's certainly something that I'm due to do in the next six months. This is, I, this mentioned, is, I mentioned earlier in the podcast, this is why I'm uh, developing some seminar-based stuff with someone else because we thought about making this material part of our academy or almost like a, an intro program to our academy to make sure people are mentally ready for what they're about to learn and how they're about to change people to make sure they're in the right place. But we kind of realize you, I don't think you can truly do this stuff via an online program. I think you can make some great progress. And I think people that are already quite aware of their own body and their own mind, like for me, for example, I think I would do quite well in an online program because I think I'm quite personally aware already and I'm quite well developed um, psychologically because I've worked on it personally but I think this kind of stuff you've, you've got to work with someone person to person whether that's in a big group set in small group one to one you've got to be able to feel that you're in a room with similar and like minded people be really present um, and that's the problem with online programs at the moment this is one thing we're working at with our academy is to force people to again be more present more because you might listen to an online webinar but do you actually take yourself to a room in your house, switch everything off, get your notepad out, get your pen out, and have zero dis distractions apart from that webinar? Like, we'll be teaching our academy, and I bet there's people that are also on their phone, doing other stuff, making the dinner. I'm like, you're not going to learn properly if you're not actively involved and present in that moment to digest that information and nothing else. That's why I think seminars are great, because it takes you out of your normal environment. And if you're attending a seminar and you're on your phone the entire time, 
you're not going to be present there. And so I do like seminars for, for exactly that reason. Um, and, you know, like the best, the best webinars that I have attended, I've been fully present in them. And I've been exactly the same where I thought, okay, you know, I've got a webinar at seven o'clock in the evening. I'm just going to kind of make my dinner at the same time or I'm going to eat at the same time or I've got like some notes to write at the same time. I can't remember those webinars. The ones that I remember are the ones that I've been fully engaged in. I think we should probably call it a day on that podcast. That's 40 minutes and I don't, I, I don't know, I kind of want to keep the message quite simple today. We've got loads yeah. of amazing questions that, that we'll leave till next week. Um, it's not a problem. They'll wait. They won't go anywhere. Um, so for me, if I just wanted to sum up, sum up today, everything that you do going forward, just have a think about how present you are and what you're doing. Your training, your nutrition, your hydration, your family, your work. How engaged are you? Because... The mind, as much as we want to believe it, is shit at multitasking. It's yeah. rubbish. You can't... Yeah. It's called multi-switching. You switch from one task to the other. But you don't actually engage in both those tasks. So it doesn't matter whatever you're doing, but make sure you switch and engage and be active. Especially, um, you know, this is really important for me uh, with someone that owns their own business, that you, you finish work and then you engage in kind of home life or you engage in whatever else you're doing because it, it deserves your attention you've made that commitment to change your attention to someone else or a different scenario so that deserves your full commitment um so just take a load of lessons out of what we've spoken spoken about today and just just be more present and think about how you're going to develop in the future as a result of that good summary Oh, I take it you've got nothing more to add. I have nothing for this to add, Your Honour. Right, uh, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please do us the massive honour of just sharing it with someone else. I think we've talked about some really cool stuff today. So just find a friend, find someone else that could do this kind of information, especially in the fitness industry. There's just so much fucking bullshit in the fitness industry where we're just being led astray by so many different things, phones, images, Instagram, programs, videos, all sorts. Um, you know, you need to shield yourself from this kind of stuff and be a lot more focused and driven with your goals. Um, and actually, just a practical tip, when we were, again, when we were at our seminar, someone brought up Facebook and how distracting Facebook is. Uh, one of the things you can actually do on Facebook is build your own timeline. If you go to the arrow at uh, the top right-hand corner of posts, um, there's an area. So, for example, on my Facebook, I have a news feed called Cool Shit I Like. So I can log on to Facebook, and instead of looking at my news feed, I can create the news feed that I want to see. So one of the comments in the room was is that, oh, I find Facebook really distracting, but I still want to go on Facebook and read like your Facebook posts and Rachel's and other people that I like. So I'm like, okay, so build your own Facebook feed where my stuff shows up, Rachel's, and you know all the people that you want to listen to, and none of the fluff. And that way you can start to actually engage in the information that you want to see online to keep learning, because remember, social media is an incredible platform to learn and discover new information, but also shield yourself from all the rubbish on there um, that you, you, know, you kind of don't want to see, especially all the negativity that might be in your timeline. So again, it's about being present and looking at these things that we're using and going, how can I change this thing that I'm using to to make me being present more valuable? Again, this all comes down to being present in the moment and really critically looking at what you're doing. Anyway, please share this with, show with the uh, friends and family. I will be on the show next week with Dave Cripps. We're talking about um, training athletes, being an incredible coach. He's an ex Leicester rugby, uh, ex Leicester Tigers rugby strength and conditioning coach of 10 years. It was a fantastic episode. I'm really, really, really happy with how it panned out. He's a great mind. And again, if you're a coach, it's going to make you think more and more about how you operate as an individual and the character traits and values that you operate within. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you for the amazing and ever present Rachel. Bye. Thanks for having me. And I will see you all next week. Bye. 
Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 145, I hope. Uh, he says that I'm uh, doing a lot of travelling this summer, so I'm trying to pre-record as much as possible. So if I get it wrong, I apologise, we're only human. Anyway, today, uh, as usual, I've got someone far more intelligent on the show than me. 